Wembley has been hosting the men and women's FA Cup finals this weekend, but the area is also notable for Michaela Community School, which produces pupils who regularly outperform those from more affluent areas. And the school features in a documentary on ITV next Sunday called Britain's Strictest Headmistress. Let's take a look. The critics of Michaela speak of it as if it's a gulag. They speak of it as if it's a poorhouse. Right, Zaren, you've got one detention, and you come. I'm in detention today because I didn't make proper eye contact with my maths teacher when she was teaching the lesson. Please stand for the headmistress. Stand. The reason why children in disadvantaged positions end up failing is because nobody said to them, this isn't good enough. You said to me, you really want to be at this school. A couple of hours later, you were in the corridors misbehaving. I am so disappointed. I would get sent death threats and uh, wishes of cancer. I have lost friends because I work here. They don't really like Catherine because she's quite outspoken. I think some people think I've joined a cult. It's got an email from Cambridge. Oh, I got an offer! Woo! Yeah. Yeah, he's got a place! He's got a place! Oh! The idea that giving children good discipline and excellent teaching and an opportunity to achieve is somehow bad, I just don't understand it. And I'm delighted to say that that very headmistress, Catherine Burblesing, joins me now. Catherine, Hello. thanks very much for joining Maybe. me tonight. Yes, so thanks for having me. Congratulations on the film, which is obviously out next week. Um, can I ask you a bit about the school? And for those who don't know, uh, from the way it's described there, you have lots of uh, rules that other schools simply don't impose. Can you give us an example of the kind of things that you do? Well, I have to say, actually, that... Um, our behavior policy is probably very similar to lots of other schools. It's just that we tend to always follow through on it. But I suppose the big difference is we have silent corridors, so the children walk in silence quickly to their lessons in single file. Uh, why? Because it means they get to their lessons faster. And when you're trying to catch children up in the inner city with their reading and their maths so that they have a chance to uh, compete with their with their private school peers at 16 and at 18, it makes sense to be in the classroom for longer. Um, that's one big thing. Other things? Well, I don't know. That seems to be the biggest thing. I mean, the main thing is that we follow through on stuff um, and we hold our standards high for absolutely everyone. So people call our type of school a no excuses school, meaning that when the child comes and says, I couldn't do my homework because the dog ate it or the bus was late or whatever it is, um, you don't accept the excuse. Um, and I'd say too often in our schools, when you have, say, uh, children from poorer backgrounds or children where their fathers aren't there or children live, living on estates or they're black or they're any kind of ethnic minority, any kind of reason to think, oh, well, we should lower our standards for this child because the, the teacher who feels relatively privileged feels bad about keeping their standards really high because they think, well, I don't know what it is to be very poor, so I'm going to let their homework go in this instance. I would argue that actually in the end you let the child down because they never really meet those standards, and in the end when they leave school they leave with lower results and fewer good habits to be successful with their lives. I mean, that's one of the things that I don't think even your harshest critics could deny, that you do get results. I mean, the, 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 the pupils do uh, perform remarkably well. Uh, and, and these are largely underprivileged kids. So is this not a system that other schools ought to be considering bringing on board? Yeah, but like I say, there's a lot... Um... There's a kind of gut reaction against this. And there are other schools that do similar things that are very good on the discipline. But 
Often uh, we as schools will get attacked for this sort of thing, reciting poetry by heart. For instance, we would sing God Save the Queen or Jerusalem in order to inculcate a love of Britain in the children. Uh, we often get attacked for that sort of thing. Um, and I suppose that's because the sort of woke left are very anti um, tradition and they're anti uh, strong discipline in schools. Um, they feel that it's oppressive. They feel that you're removing uh, freedom and um, kind of fun uh, from the classroom. But I would argue that things are all the more fun when you feel safe and secure, when you know that you can reach your classroom in one piece. So you're not going to be trampled. You're not going to be beaten up. Um, and I think a lot of people who comment on these things don't really know the uh, the realities of, of 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 schools with challenging intakes. Well, what do you say to people who claim that what you're outlining here is just an old fashioned approach to school teaching? Well, it is a bit old fashioned. They're sort of right. I mean, uh, I would say that our teaching methods are also um, traditional. So what happens is the teacher stands at the front of the classroom and leads the learning with the desks in rows and everyone looking towards the teacher. And some of your viewers might think, but that's normal. That's what happens in classrooms. It hasn't been happening for many, many years. In, in many classrooms, you will see elsewhere um, and not, you know, there are other traditional schools, but in schools that are more progressive, the desks will be in groups and the children are looking at each other. And there is what is called child centered learning, where the children are leading the learning rather than the teacher. And so in the 50s, of course, what I'm saying was perfectly normal. Uh, nowadays, it's quite radical and relatively controversial. So, um, and why is it the teacher should lead? Because the teacher knows more. The teacher has a degree and uh, lots of experience. And th there's much more of this talk nowadays of, well, the, the teacher might say, I learn just as much from the children as the children learn from me. And I sort of think that means you're probably not a very good teacher because you <laughs> ought to be teaching them more. <laughs> and do you think something went wrong at some point in terms of the way in which the direction that schools were taking? Is it just that, that or is it just a general cultural attitudinal shift towards education? Yeah, um, I think that partly it has to do with the knowledge that is taught. So. Um, the kind of white guilt around teaching uh, dead white men or teaching um, anything that's traditional. I mean, these days, uh, th there is even talk in some parts of America where they'll say maths is racist, you know, and they argue that two plus two doesn't equal four and that it can equal five. I mean, there is, um, there is a real push to uh, reject traditional education that uh, we, we knew for, for decades and decades, although I would say it has been slow. And since the 60s, really, that has been deteriorating. And we've now reached a stage where, uh, well, where those of us who are traditional are, are being vilified and we're having to fight back. And it isn't just, I would stress, that the results are good in terms of GCSEs and that sort of thing. Uh, what's mo what I'm most proud of is the types of children are, the, the children, our children, what they are. So they're kind, they're decent, they're going to live honest lives. They're the kinds of people who, when a plate falls in the lunch hall, other children don't laugh. They run to help them pick up the plate. And that's the kind of thing that I would hope to see everywhere. And of course, there are schools who encourage that kind of behavior. But I would say that far too often we don't realize how much, um, poor, uh, behavior exists in schools and therefore poor learning. Um, and we don't really admit it. And it, it's not really possible to get into schools. You know, like if you wanted to visit any of the local schools, you, you try and get in, you won't be able to go in and see the schools. We, on the other hand, have 600 visitors a year. They come and do a tour with the kids and they see the, the lessons. And, and, and everybody who comes says, wow, I can't believe it. Look how happy the children are, how joyful the place is. But people are presume that if you have good discipline, that children must somehow be unhappy. And I would argue that it's quite the opposite. Children thrive in a, in order and structure because they feel safe and secure. And it's at that point that they push the boat out and they can be creative and they can come up with their own points of view. But it's only in an orderly environment that they can do that. Do you think uh, that a lot of the reasons why things changed is because perhaps in the past uh, schools were too strict 
there was bullying, uh, the things imposed on kids. They did make some children's lives uh, miserable. And actually, by centering the child more and uh, being attentive to their emotional needs, that what you're actually that it comes from a good place, I suppose, is what I'm saying. Yes, I think that used to be the case. Um, I'm not sure that's so much the case now, but I think definitely, I think that's a good point. And I think that sometimes teachers, you know, 50, 60, 70 years ago, might have bored the class just standing up at the front and reading something. If you come and see it, Michaela, our lessons aren't like that at all. They're chunked up. The children, you know, we have turn to your partner where they discuss something, then they feed back to the teacher. Um, there are class discussions. It, it, it's, it's a wonderful space of learning. But I think you're right that once upon a time, the more boring teachers would have done things in a very very boring didactic way. And so the, the, the changes that were made in the first place did make things better. It's just that things have now got out of hand. And, um, and so in the end, you've got a bunch of children uh, talking to each other while the teacher moves around the, the desks as a more of a facilitator of learning as opposed to a teacher at the front leading the learning. Well, I mean, all of this is very fascinating. I can't wait to see the documentary. That's next Sunday on ITV, Britain's strictest headmistress. Catherine Burblesing, thanks very much for joining me.